Alrighty, good evening, everyone, and once once again, welcome back to another episode of Dodgeball of the Month. Today, we actually have the privilege and the honor to announce your January Dodgeball of the Month, Tony Stopo himself. How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? Not doing too bad. Can't complain. Cannot complain. So, um, as you already know, you are the alumni dodgeball of the month because alumni month is always um it's january and that's when we do our recognition for an alumni so first of all congratulations thank you um and second of all you know how you feel about having this prestigious honor to your long list of accomplishments well i gotta be honest at first when I found out I was baller of the month, um, I didn't know that it was an alumni thing for alumni month. So I said, all right, like, is Kevin trolling me? Like what's going on here? Why isn't it a, a isn't it a current player? But then I realized there's like an alumni uh, factor there. So yeah, no, it was cool that um, I guess people still think of me a little bit and uh, in my current involvement in the league, which isn't a ton, but you know, I, I help with streams and commentary. So that's cool. No, I mean, your, your work within the league is extremely valuable because, you know, many people recognize you as the voice of dodgeball. My humble opinion, I definitely recognize you as the voice of Michigan because you understand the playing style of your fellow players in Michigan. You understand their styles and their tendencies. Your information is extremely knowledgeable and extremely on point, too. And considering that you're not always, like, watching these guys at practices but just very quickly just picking up on it like oh yeah i already know what this play is going to do like that's not easy to do um so with that being said um i know personally that you play in the league because we play against each other for michigan state but have you played dodgeball before you actually started playing the ncda yeah so so I only played the two years in NCDA in grad school. So I was a little bit older and got a later start to NCDA. Um, I played a little bit before that. I started in like 2011 or 2012. Um, that's when I met Paul Hillebrand and found out like, hey, there's more dodgeball out there. Uh, but I played elite tournaments for a few years before I uh, got into NCDA with Michigan State. Gotcha. And for the viewers at home who don't know what elite dodgeball is, Tony, would you be so kind as to, you know, quickly explain what that is? Yeah, I'd say it was, you know, it's the regional tournaments that were, I guess the elite dodgeball invitational is the best of the best gathering once a year. And that's originally what it was meant to be. And it kind of grew beyond that to these regional tournaments, um, three in each region for seeding that helped out for nationals. So it was really a big nationwide league, uh, 6v6, much different game than NCDA, but um, yeah, rubber ball, um, co-ed, women's, no sting, stuff like that. So, Yeah, so you, you've been playing for a long time and competing against some of the best of the best in the North region, which has open 8.5 and pinch. So when you made that slight transition from elite dodgeball, which is now considered USA dodgeball, the USA dodgeball premier, um, was it easier or was it harder for you when you made that transition when you went to MSU um, for grad school? Um, I'd say, honestly, you know, hopefully this isn't just a cop-out answer, but it was a mixed bag. Um, some things were harder and some things were easier. What was definitely easier, I thought, my first year in the league, they still had dirty blocking. So you could block it into yourself and you'd be okay. Um, and it was a little bit farther throw line. So that first year, I was like, okay, I come from 25 and 25 feet, smaller court, does not allow dirty blocking, to 30 feet with dirty blocking. Like, as long as I have a ball in my hand, I'm never going to get out. That was not the case, but that's just how I felt when I took the court. Um, and then things that were harder was, you know, in elite, you know, you could walk 10 feet, maybe 20 feet easily set up a throw. Um, here I'm having to run 60 feet to get close enough to make a, a well-timed throw. Um, and I'm certainly not known for just being able to throw the ball through somebody at, at 20 or 25 feet, let alone at 30 feet. So definitely having to make sure that like all my throws were spotted, right? <laughs> Which I know there's some people that'll tee off on that comment about hitting my spots or not after, after one 
famous incident. But uh, yeah, so it was a mixed bag for sure. There were certain aspects that I picked up right away. Um, some things took me a little while. And I definitely think even even only playing two years, like the amount of improvement in that format specifically that I had from year one to two was was significant. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember playing against you guys when I was in graduate school at VCU. And I remember like how difficult it was to try to get you out because one, you're a lefty. That's one. And, and two, lefties are just a lot harder to read from the ball because most people are right-handed. So that, that lefty curve really kind of threw me off quite a bit. And he was always extremely well when it came to blocking. So even that within itself was not easy. So, so yeah, no, I, I believe that because – I also played during a time period where dirty blocking was a thing. And if you had two balls, you was like, it was virtually impossible to get you out. Like, yeah, it, it allowed teams to, to like go into their just kind of like corner huddle strategy back when it was like 15 on 15, it was like much easier to protect a, like a one point lead or something with dirty blocking. You just set up a couple guys in the corner. And I like that you can't do that anymore. Really? Like, so. Yeah, no, it, it definitely makes the game more fun to watch. And also, you know, you got to be more strategic with certain things. Um, but, yeah, um, you know, we talk about your experience in dodgeball, you know, very wise, very intelligent. We talk about your experience at MSU. Um, you also do commentating and really good at it, too. Like, I'm not going to lie. That's not me blowing smoke. Like, that's me being very transparent. Like, you are extremely thorough with your analysis and with your information. Where did you learn this skill set? Because I remember having a previous conversation with you saying, like, you know, you was focusing on, you know, financial stuff. But where did you get this skill set of, like, you know, doing commentating, but then also doing it in a way to where if someone had no idea what color dice was by the by the end of that game, they're like, "Oh, I already know what's going on." Because Tony told me. So, where, where do you learn that skill from? I don't know if I learned it or if I just kind of was able to pick it up. Like, obviously, I really like dodgeball, so it's it's easy to talk about something that you like um, and stay engaged with it. Like, especially commentating for the Michigan teams. Like, I'm always interested in what they're doing. Um, I also think, and a couple friends and I were joking about it during the Super Bowl about commentary. I, I feel like I've had like 30 years of just watching sports and hearing different commentators and all the different things that they said and the way they present the game um, just kind of like stuck in my head. And so you'll hear me say a lot of, hopefully I'm not too, I don't know what the word is, like, you know, but I, I just everything I've picked up from these professionals out there, like the people that commentate my local sports teams and stuff, my Detroit sports teams, I've just been able to kind of hear what they do and like really listen and, and kind of take it, put my own twist on it and put it out there. Um, and I don't know, I just kind of picked it up. I, I feel like the first couple of times we did it, it was good. And now, you know, when me and Kevin are in the booth or, you know, Dylan joins us up there and stuff, like, I think we've got a really good flow. You and I did it a couple of years ago and we did a nice job of like me being the play by play. And then you coming in with like the color commentary of and the energy with like, look at that throw. You know, I might've called out the throw, like great hit. Oh my God. Like, so, you know, knowing when to let somebody else jump in and talk, I think is a big, uh, a big thing too. Yeah. And, and, and I, and I say that too, because like, you know, my experience is very similar, like watching a lot of NBA, um, NBA on NBC when it was still on NBC, um, NBA on TNT, my personal favorite, a little bit of NBA on ESPN and, and kind of just envisioning like, okay, what type of speaker I want to be, like what type of storyteller do I want to be when it comes to providing energy. But you always need somebody who can just, just tell it as it is and kind of remain as neutral as possible but still kind of giving both teams their flowers when they're doing well, but then also their fair criticism when they're not doing well. So no, that's, that's amazing. Like that's, that's not an easy skill to learn, especially when you didn't go to school for it, but you are a natural at it. So I just want to say 
I enjoy watching you do commentating, especially for the Michigan teens, because you know exactly what you're talking about. Thanks. Yeah. No, I enjoy it. As long as they'll keep letting me do it, I'll keep trekking out for tournaments to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but that being said, is there um, other responsibilities that you kind of do within the dodgeball community? Because I remember you were talking about, you know, you being a kind of like an integral part of elite dodgeball in the North, like when it's trying to like start growing out. Do you have like any um, leadership positions that you do with USA Premier by any chance? Not an official title anymore. There, there's, we're definitely going through a transitory period with like uh, USA kind of absorbing elite and taking those those rounds. And they're kind of playing things a little closer to the, the vest because um, there's been issues in the past. Um, we won't get into details, but you know, right now USA wants to make sure that they put out a, a good product and um, and that other people aren't kind of taking and running with it and. and USA, this is the first full season for them because everything got messed up with, you know, two years of pandemic shutdowns and not really having tournaments. So um, when I was with Elite, um, Mark Akam had kind of, Glenn was transitioning out of the leadership position in the North because he moved to the West Coast. So it was easier to have boots on the ground here. So that's when like Colin and I came in and kind of, you know, took a two-headed approach to to run in the North and really helping Mark, you um, Colin more so with like the big picture stuff for elite, you know, on a national level, me more focusing just on the North. Um, and, and I still help Jake where I can right now, um, trying to help get venues, things like that. I still have actually a bunch of the equipment. Um, and then, you know, we ran our kind of one-off tournaments last year that um, I'd really give Felix more of the credit. He made sure we had venues and a schedule and insurance if we needed it and then like day to day i was helping run it because i would bring the equipment and work on the courts and make sure you know one first one in last one out kind of thing so um but yeah as far as usa dodgeball goes um i'm not sure if they're planning on bringing back the competition committee last you know two years ago when we were planning a 2020 season when we thought it would exist um i was still on the competition committee for that and then like one of the leaders in the north so we'll kind of see what happens if they'll have me. Sure. Um, I don't know how much time I'll have left to do that. You know, we're probably at a point soon where I'll have to, to find a replacement. <laughs> oh man. No, you no, don't, 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 don't talk to me about retirement, Tony. No, no, that's no, 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 that's not retired. That would be me stepping back from a leadership role, you know, and, and focusing more on just being there to play when I can. Um, and, and, yeah, Tony Tony versus time, so we'll, we'll hang on as long as we can. Fair enough. I, I respect that, and I, I respect your transparency because it's anytime like you're a part of a organization, profit, nonprofit, there's always stuff that's going on, and, you know, at the end of the day, you know, people just trying to do what's best for that organization and, and try to do it without as much conflict as possible. But, no, I totally get it. Hopefully um, the 2022 season – for USA Dodgeball Premier will be able to go in in full operation because I understand we're still in a pandemic. People, you know, got to be safe and whatnot. Some vendors like, eh, maybe, eh, maybe not. So I I understand there's a lot of news, nuances that's involved Mm -hmm. with that. So I I, I totally get that. Um, uh, With that being said, uh, I have two more questions from my end. Um, Number one, um, what was your overall feeling when you saw Michigan State win they first Michigan Dodgeball Cup in Boy, 17 years? So if you, you know, if you go back and watch that stream, like the energy just in the booth too, like me and Kevin are there and I'm trying to keep it as professional as possible. And so is Kevin. You've got Riley and I want to say Dylan was still up there too with us and maybe one other person. And they're just, watching this unfold and, and Riley's energy was crazy to my left. Like he was going nuts and, and he doesn't have a dog in that fight. You know, he's, he's a central guy. He's just wanting to watch good dodgeball. Um, three Oh at half. I was like, boy, this is turning into a, like a real stinker here. Um, no one's going to watch this stream. Like I was hoping we'd get our numbers up and then all of a sudden, like, you know, Michigan state started putting pressure on and they got that first point. And I'm like, 
cool, like a moral victory in my head is all I'm thinking because it took half the half. It took like 12 minutes, I want to say, ish to get that point. I'm like, you know, now they got to do that twice in the same amount of time. Like that's tough. And I don't know, like, I don't want to discredit. I'm like, I don't know what more if Michigan went and seized it or if Grand Valley just blew it. But as we're watching it come closer and closer, as a state grad, I'm like, as a state alumni of the program, I'm like, I want to see this thing go to overtime. Like, I want to see Michigan State come all the way back. That's great. As somebody who, like, knows tons of Grand Valley alumni, you know, one of my teammates is is on their team, Ben Smart. I don't like seeing him lose ever. Um, and, and unfortunately, he couldn't even, you know, be out there to help his team. And I know that's killing him. Um you know, to watch that unfold, there it, it was it's like some mixed emotions, but like energy wise, I was, that place was as loud as I've ever heard a dodgeball tournament. Um, and it was really, really cool. And so to be a part of that and then have be on the call for it. Um, I, I won't say it's quite like Al Michaels miracle on ice in 1980. Cause I don't think I'm, I don't think I threw out some signature line, but just being the one to like be there, call that um, was really, really cool. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly because I was watching that tournament from home, just kind of just monitoring the stream. And I was reading, you know, even the Michigan dodgeball preview. And of course, in my head, because, you know, like I see myself as not only a fan of the game, but also a student of the game. I was like, OK, Michigan State, they beat Grand Valley at Sacknall in November convincingly. <laughs> then January comes around, Grand Valley defeats Michigan State convincingly. Both yeah. teams were one on one. So I was like, okay, like Sagadol, like, sorry, Grand Valley only got one loss in their resume. And that's against Michigan State. And but Grand Valley also went to overtime against Cincinnati back in November at Ohio. And then Michigan State kind of lost against Cincinnati in December. So of course in my head, I'm like, okay, we already got a storyline. Yeah. These are the, you know, these are the two teams that many experts, both in the e-board and the content team, as well as the league, is like, okay, Grand Valley, Michigan State, one of these two teams is gonna win. No disrespect to Western Michigan. They only had nine players. Mid playing in the Michigan region as a fairly new team is extremely difficult. Yeah. Like, even some of your better players from, like, other regions will probably have a hard time just because the amount of stress of playing a very slow-paced, very conservative style. Like, every mistake is magnified, like, over a factor of a 1,000, if not more. So, and then you got Saginaw, which some people may say historically it's a second-half team. And we're not, we're not saying that as a dig. We're just saying they get – they started to peak – during the second half, leaning towards Nationals. They play much better than they did at Grand Valley just a month ago and way better than their first tournament in November. But we all knew it was Michigan State versus Grand Valley, and the people who set up the schedule knew that. They did that intentionally. Yep. So, but, yeah, no, it was, it was a wild finish. Yeah. Right. I'll just say like two things. So like it actually, you know, we're trying to like work the camera too. Um, and so like watching it as a fan and trying to call it, like it, it was distract. It was hard to like keep an eye on making sure we're like following the plays for the people watching. And part of my fear, like I said, it, you know, 3-0 Grand Valley and, and they could make what they can. Grand Valley could make a ton of excuses. They they're very good at just, Hey, you know what? Somebody's out next man up and, and, I was surprised to see them go up three nothing. And I honestly think they just kind of ran out of gas and couldn't, couldn't stay up in the second half with Michigan state and overtime. Like, I think it was just a, like attrition, you know, no Ben smart. Tom Williamson was lost for the second half and overtime. Josh Hill started cramping. Tyler peach was having issues all day. And, and I don't want to make excuses and discredit Michigan state's win, you know, because they had still had to, they still went down three nothing and had to come all the way back. Um, but yeah, just kind of watching that inspired play was was great. And Grand Valley did a nice job of, of next man up. They played a lot of freshmen who haven't played really meaningful points yet and still only lost by one point to a top three team. And and I do think Saginaw, like you mentioned, Saginaw 
kind of sh sh surprised Grand Valley a little bit. Um, that first point, we were like, whoa, what got into Saginaw? But that's, you know, us, those of us who had played in the region, that wasn't a surprise. Right, and, <laughs> right. And that's what I'm saying, too. Like, and that's, you know, and that's one of the reasons why, like, and, and I mean this with all due sincerity because I'm not BSing here. Like, that's one of the reasons why I was happy that you was the main person who was calling that because you're able to see things from the Michigan perspective that even me as an East Coast person, I'm not going to be able to see that. Like, I didn't know that Grand Valley only had 12 players coming into that tournament and Ben Smart wasn't playing. I didn't know he got injured. You knew that information going into that tournament. So now you're already creating that story of, listen, if GV wins, this is like a big deal because they're not in that full strength. Yeah. And they're still dominating. Even if they lose, they're not going to make the excuses because that's not who they are. They're just You can just say like, hey, like you try playing a tournament with only 12 people. Like we have several examples not just from this year, but from previous years, that the top team with only 12 people and no bench, at some point they're going to get tired. Yeah. At some point they're going to be fatigued. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And no, you was absolutely right. I was seeing the same thing. I was like, wait a minute. If GV scores another point in the second half, it's a very different conversation. But I saw them slowing down because I see players not doing things that I normally am accustomed to seeing. Like I don't see Tyler Peach slowing down and right. just doing simple reset throws just to keep the clock moving. Like I don't see that. I saw Josh Hill being super aggressive and just crushing people. Yeah, like, he was kind of a standout in that perspective. I mean, and he had to make a, a much higher volume of throws than he's had to in the past. Uh, because of some of that attrition we talked about. But, yeah, you, you kind of look at both those programs right now. In my opinion, they should both stay in, like, the top three. Um, there's no reason, you know, I think they would end up just kind of swapping positions. Cincinnati didn't do anything to deserve to fall behind necessarily either one of them or anything. Um, it, you know, it's a win for Michigan State. You finally figured out, like, kind of how to win the big one, get that monkey off your back, MVC. Like, we've had really good teams at MVC that were favored going in and went over, and it was embarrassing. You know, and if you're Grand Valley, a loss is never fun for a program like that. But you also got to be thinking to ourselves, like, look at what we didn't have. Yeah. And we still jumped out to a 3-0 lead and we, we lost in overtime, like, to a great team. So both teams got to come out of it feeling good. It's a different, different, it's a different type of good, but they should both feel good about it in a sense. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And in my personal opinion, still – top three teams in the league. Um, and it's going to be pretty and, – and, and, of course, both teams are only going to get better. Mm -hmm. And that's the scary part. Yeah. Like, that, that's why I'm just like, eh. But those of you who say, like, oh, GV is – relax, relax. They, not many teams have beat them. So, so stop. Yeah. Um, but, um, but last question for my end. <laughs> sure. um, like I said, you, you've done a lot of things for the league and whatnot – um, what would you like? And and I know you're not retiring anytime soon, okay. but when is your time? When it is your time to go, what would you want your legacy to be? Ooh, um, boy, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I I just there's a quote that my friend one time said years and years ago, and it kind of stuck with me and I, I don't know how to make it happen, but it's one of those things where I've always said, like, I don't have the, I don't have to be the greatest. I just want to be remembered. So I guess the way I can continue that legacy is, you know, hopefully people will remember some of these great games I've commentated and hear my voice and, and like get something out of it. And as far as playing goes, um, you know, hopefully I'll be remembered as a good teammate. And, and I really hope that Kraken still exists long after I'm done. Um, I don't want Kraken to, to necessarily fold with, with us, my older generation starting to retire and hang it up. I, I hope the name on the front continues to last a lot longer than the names on the back. Yeah, no, that's no, those are great answers. Those, those are great answers indeed. 
Uh, and with that being said, uh, that ends the serious <laughs> part. Of the I can't end. wait to hear some of these questions. You, you've got me excited and a little nervous, quite frankly, for some of the content team questions. Like I like I said before, beforehand, those series questions, those came for me. The questions from the content team, that did not come for me. <laughs> so right. Any emotions from here on out was not for me. You can come, you can go out to the content team. All, All right. right. So first question, and obviously this is a silly one. It's like, would you rather eat a dozen unfrozen cherry pot tarts 10 minutes before your first game of a tournament day or play a tournament where your stats are as follows one catch not at a clutch moment two kills not in a clutch moment get caught 30 times uh how many what, what was the quantity of food the quantity of food so you eat a dozen unfrozen cherry pot tarts 10 minutes before your first game of a tournament day. All right. So I that, that, this sounds like a classic Felix question, or would you rather? I'm going to go with the, the cherry pop tart. Like, I don't want that stat line. I think, I think honestly, if I did, I, I ate all that, had that sugar high, I would, I'd probably put up some pretty good numbers in that first game. I may not be effective the rest of the day, but I would at least cover that stat line on the, you know, probably get a few more kills and catches just off that sugar rush and then crash later on. No, nah, no, nah, that was definitely from Felix. And no, nah, that's that's probably the safe answer because no one's trying to get caught 30 times in a game. No. All right, so here's another good question. Um, what is your final four predictions in the NCDA? Ooh, okay. Um, obviously, a lot of it is going to depend on who comes out of what side of the bracket and everything. Um I'm going to guess these teams are all going to be ranked within the top five or six when we get there. So I'm going to go with um, Cincinnati, Grand Valley, Michigan State, and based on some of the scores I'm seeing, JMU. Ooh, okay. I have not seen them, but, like, I, I think they went through a lull a couple years ago, but JMU always just seems to have athletes. Um, and I, I saw their scores from this past weekend against, like, Penn State and Towson and stuff, and, like, yeah, they you know they're putting the league on notice. I think so. Hopefully, I get to see them in person before nationals at some point, or you got to catch a stream here um, from War or something. Yeah, and uh, and fun fact, um, I would be at the War tournament for both days, um, and I already know that uh, Towson and Penn State. Last time I checked, would be in attendance. Okay. And we're going to see to try to have not one, but both courts live stream for the derivation of the day. Can't guarantee that you're going to get commentating for both of them. We're going to try to get that arranged, but you would definitely have an opportunity to see everybody play. So this is a little FYI right there, but no. Um, all right. So those are the three, those are the 14 um, Grand Valley, Sensi, Michigan state. And then what some will consider a dark horse, which is kind of weird saying that, but JMU being the dark horse, but yeah, that 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 kind of makes sense. I will give my personal prediction in another broadcast okay. later on this week. But no, those at least from what I've seen thus far, those are good picks. Um, I guess if you were asking me, since you mentioned dark horse, I'll give a little bonus content here. Ooh. If I have to give a dark horse team, and I have not seen them play, but I've seen some scores and rankings, and um, I'm a big Nittany bit. Ha. Big Nittany Lion fan, so I'm gonna say Penn State. I would love to see them break through. Ooh, you heard listen, you heard you heard there first, ladies and gentlemen. A Michigan man's giving love outside the region. Do not say that Michigan does not recognize what y'all are doing. All right. Don't 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 say that. All right. A little love to for the for Penn State. All right. That's what's up. Um, and that's saying a lot too, since both y'all are been 10 rivals. Like I it's a, it's a decently well-documented fact that I grew up as a kid, like right outside, I grew up 20 minutes away from U of M, uh, but I grew up a Penn State fan. So oh, mostly Penn State football. So like, if I'm being honest, I don't really care about other Penn State sports, but like in the fall, it's Penn State football ride or die. Um, oh. That game against Michigan State is always a tough one for me since, you know, I went to grad school at Michigan State, played dodgeball there, you know, but yeah. 
I love Penn State, so I'll let it be known. Oh, okay, that's that. That is some um, new information. Uh, I I was just thinking that you was Michigan all the way, but there's there's a little love for for the for the for the Penn you know for Penn State. I I respect that. Um, another good question. Um, what are three schools that you can add into the NCDA if you had the ability to magically snap your fingers? Like if it was within your ability, what would be the three schools that you would want within the NCDA? Um, so I guess, it, all right, I'm taking that question from the perspective of like, I would want to add the three schools that I think would be best for the league right now. I think it'd be very cool if you could have like USC, UCLA, like, you know, uh, name a third California team and start to build out the California region because it's really, really cool out there. Um, so that would, or I mean, dodgeball is really big out there in other communities. You know, there's WeHo Dodgeball, Elite started there. Um, so having college teams on the West Coast would be cool. The league isn't quite there yet logistically where we can be having the nationals and having teams fly across the country. So right now, as it stands with us being largely East Coast and, and Midwest and everything, I'm going to say Eastern Michigan. Um, I think we're sorely lacking a presence on the Eastern side of the state. I mean, I know we've got Saginaw, but it's a little farther up there. I think Eastern Michigan is great because you can bring the Ohio teams up. It's not very far for them. The Michigan teams come over and it's a great place to host Ohio versus Michigan teams. Um Beyond that, I'm going to say Indiana, another Big Ten school, continue kind of that bridge the gap between Ohio and Illinois where you could have DePaul and UWP and stuff start heading out west that way. <laughs> and then last but not least, um, I'm going to say Kansas. Ooh. Okay. I would love to see kind of, I think of those blue bloods in basketball, like, you know, Kentucky and Kansas are like two of the names that come to mind really quickly. And so I'd love to see them play in dodgeball, even though I know they're in different conferences for basketball and everything, but um, that would just be kind of cool for us. But I, I think geographically, it doesn't make a ton of sense yet, but I think that would be really cool. Wow. Okay. Uh, so fun fact, um, many years ago, even before I was a part of the league, East of Michigan was a team in the league and not I Kansas. He said that this weekend, actually. I didn't believe him, but yeah, like. Yep. Yep. I actually know a guy from, well, he moved to Richmond and uh, he was from East of Michigan and he kind of helped me learn about the NCDA and kind of helped me out with the whole pension thing many moons ago when I was a undergrad not a graduate student at vcu um kind of dated myself a little bit um and then also kansas so kansas never had a dodgeball program but kansas state university on the other hand they did also back in the 2000 2010 area as well so no those are good choices all righty and with that being said <sighs> let's get some of these what I consider controversial questions. I can't wait. I, I'm trying to say like one good question for last so we can at least end on a high note. Okay. Um, but yeah, I got to. You and I have journalistic integrity. I, I respect you trying to like keep it, you know, you can't, you can't control what the content team does. I know some of the degenerates on that team and I, you, know, you got to take it in stride. I, I'm trying, man. I'm trying. All right. So, okay. This question, which ex Kraken player do you want back the most? You know, I had a feeling a question like that might come up. Oh, God. Colin. Colin O'Brien. Oh, man. Not, ah, uh, Jesus. Not, not, ah, uh, man. Well, Boy. That's person. I mean, I, I, I respect it. I, I was saying that because you two, you know, before the whole transition from USA Dodge, but like you two work together to make sure that the North region is successful. And you know that Colin O'Brien is one of the top four players 
if I remember correctly, I think he was either two or three, but I'm pretty positive he was two. And you know that he is one of the best, if not the best player that ever came from Michigan State. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a combination of the things really to, to want to have him back. It's, I mean, Christ, you look at how many good players we had come through Kraken. It's like, it's incredible. You know, we're still competitive. Uh, I think we have a very, very good young team now. Uh, but you think about all the good players that have come through there. I mean, we had Colin, Wes, Riley, Meisel. I mean, it's just a murderer's row. You put those four teams as the core of a pinch team, who's beating them? You know what I mean? We Kel- yeah. Kelvin and Mark, too. I mean, at this point, they, they focus more on open and, and other ball formats. But, I mean, those were two of the original, like, pinch heavy hitters in the region you know, former Grand Valley captains, like those six together as a pinch team in their prime is pretty, pretty unstoppable. So it, it would be hard to give a wrong answer, but I, I guess Colin was, <laughs> you never forget your first love, right? He was the first one that got away. So I guess, you know, oh, man. He, he was the first one to like leave like that. Um, so to have, to have it back would be good. <laughs> He's going to, I'm going to get dragged in the group chat when I, when they see this. There, there's a reason why it's being recorded and not live. No, that's a you. Hey, everything that's on here, unless you, I specifically am like, I'll oh, cut that or edit that. Put it, put it out there. I'm, I'll be vulnerable. It's fine. I'm at least giving you a little bit of prep time before that time comes. Like, it's not going to come out immediately, but I'm trying to at least save you a yeah, little so there, bit. There's some question. There's some heavy hitting questions here, huh? All right. I, <laughs> there's a, there's a reason why I waited till a little bit further down the row. Um, All right. Jesus. Okay. I I want I don't want to ask that question, so I'm going to. Uh, if you're that nervous about asking the question, I'm, <laughs> that's funny. No, no, listen, like when when they was like, yo, Shadi, you got to ask him this question. I'm like, yo, like, come on, man. Like he has feelings. We all have feelings. You can't be doing this to him. All right. Um, It's either, you know, low key Dylan. Is Dylan still on the content team? Dylan Fetty? Yeah. He still is on the content team. Low key. He's the most savage one, probably. Like Kevin, Kevin outwardly is, but nobody realized like Dylan's the most savage behind closed doors. So it wouldn't shock me if the worst question was from him. No, no, no. Dylan respects me. So no, 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 no. no. I definitely know Fetty definitely has some savage moments. And I I think part of that is is like when you become a parent, you have children, like you're like, okay, like. I have patience for my children. I don't have patience for you. I'm roasting you. So I, I think that's part of it. What it comes. But, you know, surprisingly, um, he didn't ask any questions. So, okay. yeah, so you, it's, it's none from him. Um, but, yeah, um, I'm going to yeah, I'm going to have to ask this question. Um, right. Lord Jesus. Okay. And I'm not for sure if this is even 100% true or not. This is also another reason why I don't want to ask it because journalism integrity is a big thing. Um, there might be some rumors that Ben Smart might be going somewhere else, like Dynasty. So one of the questions was, will, are, will you be upset when Ben Smart goes to Dynasty? Because I know you two teams in particular have a very – interesting relationship uh yeah i mean it's hard not to get upset if your teammates leave you for that for a rival um i don't know that that's the case that's probably very much could be a troll question because they've been trolling us about that for two years and he's he's still here and yeah yeah yeah, no, I agree. And like I said, out of respect for you, I did not ask that question. And I know the rivalry between you two very well. And I am not. That was probably to. a Bailey question. And I know he's probably trying to bait me. But, you know, we beat their ass quite a bit last year. So, I mean, <laughs> it happened a few years ago. We were consistently beating them. And then they were like, okay, we'll just. 
they steal our best. They they try to steal our best players because they can't beat us head to head, man to man. So, gotcha. So this this is a follow up question because this is coming from me personally. Because again, um, with that statement, so again, trying to be professional. But again, I understand the rivalry between you two. There's respect from both teams. Let's let's not get it twisted. Like you know, and a lot of you guys are really good friends off the court. Uh, but on the court, um, there are no love loss, especially understanding that in some cases, Dynasty is like, okay, I want that player. And we're going to entice them because we have trophies. And you're like, where's the loyalty, though? Yeah. Like, when no one gave you an opportunity, I giving you this opportunity. And this is how you were paying me by going to the one team that I really don't want to see you on. Like you can go to any other team, but not this team. Like there's a reason why LeBron James caught a lot of heat. No, you know, no pen attended. Right. When he was like, all right, cool. Like I'm going to leave Cleveland and then go to Miami. Folks like you, you could have went to Sacramento it would have been cool, but you went to the one team where all your friends are together, and y'all just dominated the whole league. Like, so, the, so, so the follow-up question is, because this is this is for me. It's not from the content team. It's for me. Um, do you in the game moment, not not after the game, but in the game moment? Do you put just a little bit of extra speed, a little bit of extra spin, a little bit more accuracy to some of these players that you kind of felt like, hey, like we had a good thing going. You went to the other team. You know, if this hits you in the head, I'm not going to feel as bad in comparison to somebody. Like, is there just, just just a little bit? Like you, Like you can be honest. I mean, you know – I, I like to think I put in as much effort as I can against everybody, but you know, my matchups like that, when you're playing dynasty, when it's us against dynasty, like I get a little extra amped up for it. Sure. Um, I wouldn't say in particular, like I'm picking, like I'm trying to pick somebody out and be like, that's the one that like, if I'm going to have my hardest throw of the day, it's coming against that person's face or something. Um, that happened one time. Um, hey, Colin. Uh, but you know, I don't even know if it was my hardest throw of the day. It was just like the most perfectly timed, accurate throw in the situation. But um, yeah, I mean, against Dynasty, you always have to turn it up. Otherwise, they're going to kick your ass. So That's that's fair. I respect that. I respect that. And I, I appreciate your honesty because I feel like one thing that definitely get lost quite a bit, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, commentating for dodgeball games is so important so many times when we read articles and we watch video, we see things from a physical perspective. But we keep on forgetting that there are actual people who are actually are competing. And there's a lot of emotions that are involved while playing. And this is one of the reasons why commentating is so important. Because, yeah, I mean, you can watch something. You can see a scoreboard. You can, you can see what's going on at the time and whatnot. And I mean, that's cool. But if you understand what's going on in real time, now you are emotionally invested in what's going on. You're like, oh, this player went to this school and they always want to go to this school. That's why they're playing their heart out because they finally have an opportunity to play in front of their family. Like, like now you can see why this play is getting a little bit more amped up and emotional when they don't do well because there's 40 people cheering for him and they want him to do well. Like that's the beauty of commentating. And so, no, I mean, that makes sense. Um, and I feel like sometimes that really get lost in the grand scheme of things um, when it comes to players. Like so many times people just look at players like, oh, like he's just angry all the time. No, nah, he's probably angry because his teammate didn't tell him this is what I wanted to do. And – X, Y, and Z, and you don't find out until the day of the tournament. Yeah, I'll be angry too, respectfully. Right. 
I'll be angry too. Those are natural emotions. I feel like sometimes I get lost um, in the sauce. Um, and of course, after I just said that, now I got to ask another borderline troll, borderline serious question. <sighs> okay, so again, troll. Not for me, not for me. Which of your current team members aside from Ben Smart, is most likely going to Dynasty next. Christ. None of them. Great None answer. Them. We're going to stay the course. Great answer. Great answer. I'm me. going to... Dynasty's, Dynasty's been coming at me hard. And you know what my chance of going to Dynasty is. Uh, yeah, I, I know exactly how you feel about Dynasty. Like I said, you have a lot of respect for them, but... I know those feelings on the court, uh, and I, and I know what it tastes like. I know what it feels like, and yeah, I, I get it. Um, so, with that being said, we're going to go away from the troll questions. Now we're going to ask okay. a, a good question. Okay, so what active roster would you like? to join our league. And I think that question was kind of more in the sense of if there was like um like somebody from like USA Dodgeball Premier to currently play like just like how you came from Elite Dodgeball and then played the NCAA and went back to Elite Dodgeball. Like someone who's currently playing mm -hmm. in USA Dodgeball Premier, like who would you want to see join the NCAA? Oh, okay. I was thinking it was NCDA to, to like premiere. Um, boy, that's a good question. You know, it's such a different style. I'm not even sure how they would transition, but, um, and with the rosters, the way they are, I, <laughs> I'd love to see like either like the outsiders or, um, Oh God, what's the, what's the team with, uh, catch them in Pion's newer team. They they always have like a new team, like almost every single national. And they literally won the, the no sting title. I should know it. Um but for some reason I because we haven't played in two years now, geez. Um but yeah I, you know I'd love to see like two of those like West Coast teams form a 12 man NCDA team. Um just to see because you know the West Coast was always known for like the slow, methodical huddle, pump fake, pump fake, team throat. Like, I would love to see an all-star West Coast team come up and play NCDA style and just see if the transition is that easy for them. Um, I think they'd probably complain a little bit about all the running and stuff. And it's not the same. Not that they would struggle necessarily, but I think that would be really cool. Outsiders seem to have a good mix of, like, some young dudes with, like, Eli Hashimoto and then some, like – older guys um and they're deep like I, it seems like there's really not a weak person on that team like a weak spot um to target so like having them come up uh would be pretty cool and they're, yeah. they're a pinch they're, they're a good pinch team i know that's that's kind of like a low-key fat about them no i i played for for a south team in um minneapolis in 2018 and um i had the privilege to play against both the outsiders and um, whatever, I think at the time it was Pinch. Um, well, from, pinch. Yeah, from Pinch. So um, maybe I just changed my answer. Sorry to interrupt. Maybe I just changed my answer answer to Pinch because Pinch's roster is like seven or eight deep, but then they also like paid, they like gave their refing fees to like other guys so that their players didn't have to ref. And then those guys were in jerseys. So like everybody who was in 20, uh, 2019 nationals, everybody who was wearing a pants Jersey, I want them to be an actual team and then come up and play. So there, that's my answer. Pinch. Yeah. That's, um, that's a team strictly for pinch only. And yeah. I am in the last pinch tournament, a, a team built for pinch. Yeah, a team specifically built for Pinch. And yeah, I, I play against Ketchum. He is not a fun player to play against in Pinch. He's not fun to play against in Open, but Lord Jesus, I do not want to play him again in Pinch. Um, but yeah, Outsiders are also a really solid team from the South. Uh, I feel like a lot of people tend to discredit the South for whatever reason, but that's a solid squad. And they are 
ridiculously good at Pence too. And they got some young talent that most likely would have a really good opportunity of playing on uh, USA Dodgeball for um, for Team USA, either for um, cloth or for uh, foam um, in Canada coming up in August. So, no, that's very, very exciting. Um, but with that being said, um, those are all the questions that I have as well as the content team. Um, Tony, do you have any uh, closing thoughts by any chance? No, I uh, I mean, I, I guess I hadn't thought of any. I am looking forward to Nationals being at Western Michigan. I think it's really cool that they got the bid. Hoping maybe they can pull in a few last-minute recruits to round out a roster. Um, they have a couple promising players, so if they can get – what I'm hoping, I didn't get a roster for them really. I'm hoping they're mostly underclassmen so that they'll come back. Um, and then if they can, you know, get another half dozen guys in there, they've got a full squad plus a bench player or two. Um, that would be great, but I'm looking forward to nationals. I plan on being there to help with commentary again and stuff like that. So hopefully I get to see some teams live before that. Otherwise I'm going to have to study a little film uh, before we get there. So I know what the hell I'm talking about with, you know, if my prediction comes true and I've got an East coast team an Ohio team, and then two teams I'm very familiar with, I got to be able to, Oh who, yeah. That guy made a nice throw on JMU. What's his name? Who is that? Like checking my roster. I hopefully I can do a little homework ahead of time and um, no, just looking forward to it. And I, I think the league's come a long way. Um, I'm happy to still kind of be involved in it as much as I am because we, you know, who who knew what was going to happen after basically dodgeball was, you, you turned the off switch for dodgeball for over a year um, and for these programs to still be together um, and doing it and, and improving says a lot about the teams in the league and the players involved. Um, and, and I love the fact that we're going into a nationals and, and having seen, Cincinnati take Grand Valley to overtime, but then lose an, an, you know, to what was it, Ohio State, I think. And then like um, seeing what JMU is doing and seeing Michigan State finally break through against Grand Valley. And then, but Michigan State's lost before, like, I don't know who's going to win nationals. And I love that. Like, I can't wait to go there and actually see it unfold. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's been a while since, you know, I consider two of the best of the business uh, to join the mic. I definitely remember that 2020. Um, Michigan Dodgeball Cup. That was like the last tournament before stuff got shut down. It was it was definitely one of the the bigger tournaments before it got shut down. And of course, me being at the war was the last tournament before it got shut down. Um, and then, of course, it only makes sense that you was doing commentating for the 2022 Michigan Dodgeball Cup and really allowed the audience to have like that photo finish because thanks to the efforts of you and Kevin Bearling and Dylan Fetty um, for taking the time, energy, and effort to do the live streaming, the commentating, and the setup. I just did some stuff on the back end, so it would just work. Um, we almost had almost 90 people on YouTube watching the Michigan State versus Grand Valley game. And I'm not going to lie, that's a very difficult thing to do a day before the Super Bowl. I – um. I did notice that actually. So I always joke. I'm like, I love when we start to get more viewers. Like it kind of does amp me up a little bit. Um, I, I know we're not at a point yet where it's like, we've got 5,000 people watching. If we get there, that's amazing. That's, you know, that's great. Hopefully sponsors start rolling in or something, but we had a, a few people. And then when it was three, nothing at halftime, I was like, well, it, I'm like, this isn't going to do anything for our viewership. And I don't know if word started getting out. If people, I try to like, Hey, if you, if you're liking what you see, if you're enjoying the street, like, you know, toss us a like, share it so that people see it. And as Michigan state started getting more into that game, I literally kept like going around and looking at Kevin's laptop to see the YouTube count. And it like, it was steadily climbing. So I'm like, people must be like watching this and being like, Holy shoot, like crap. Grand Valley's like Michigan state's coming back. And, and I don't know, it was cool to see that climb and it got me a little more amped up as I was doing commentary to be like, there's more people listening and engaged right now. And you could, the crowd, like you could tell on the stream, the crowd was going ape shit too, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I remember while I was like manning the, the NCDA dodgeball account, just, just doing continuous comments, and whatnot, interacting with people like, I remember there was people saying specifically, it's like, yo, like, Shadid, like the way how Tony was talking, Grand Valley was going to win. I take a shower and now we're in overtime. Like, what did I miss? Yeah. Like, Dude, that's, that's the reason why you don't stop watching the game. 
until the clock strikes zero. Like you, you have to be emotionally involved and see this through all the way. Now, of course, there's some teams you already know. Ah, okay, they're gonna they're gonna beat the brakes off of them. We don't need to watch this. But if you know that's the game of the day, and you know the history that Michigan State has been through, you know that the fact that GV has been winning the Michigan Dodgeball Cup continuously year after year after year, yeah. and, and all the craziness that have taken place during the pandemic, outside of the sport of dodgeball, everything, you have to think at some point, like, okay, they're going to have to break through at some point. GV yeah. only got 12 players. The, the, the so-called unanimous um, MVP is currently not even playing. One of their better players also got injured. And you already know this team is coming in not at full strength. If there was ever an opportunity to win, that was the time to do it. It, it really started to become a if not now when type thing for sure. Exactly. Especially the way like how Rebecca and Kevin, the two coaches of MSU, how much time they have spent building that program yeah, and not getting paid as coaches. Like, I don't think people really understand this. Like a lot of the stuff that you see from the alumni of the NCDA, you heard the man said it himself. We're trying to get sponsors. Like, we don't get paid for this yet. This is all out of volunteer. This is all out of love. This is all out of compassion. To just try and figure out ways how to make the game better. And like I said, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for people who take the time and energy and effort to figure out ways how to elevate the game in a way to where we can start securing money for the league. And I just want to say, yeah, and I just want to say thank you for, you know, the hard work and the dedication that you have always have put within the sport. I, I personally, I personally greatly appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the recognition. I, I enjoy it. Um, hopefully, you know, long after my time, the sport has continued to grow and, and takes it to that next level. Um, I think it's a, a great sport, one of the best team ones out there, and I'd love to see great things, big things for it. But I appreciate you having me on and, and giving me this this Baller of the Month award. It's it's cool. Um, hopefully, hopefully there's someone playing in the league that gets one for active members too this month. It's not just alumni, but it's it's cool to be recognized as an alumni in the contributions. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And with that being said, um, my name is Ed Drake. For um, I was the 2020 Dodgeball of the Month. Only felt like it was fitting to properly give you know mr stompo his flowers as your 2022 dodgeball of the month for the month of january because i wanted january 2020 we didn't have a season 2021 so you know again just give him respect where respect is due uh and with that being said um that's all i have for now um the next time you would see me or potentially hear my voice will be at the war tournament, uh, which will be next weekend. Um, it's Tuesday. Um, so next Friday and Saturday, Sunday, the, the tournament is on Saturday and Sunday. And pop, and you heard Tony said himself, you know, he's going to try to get some games and um, potential for commentating before nationals. Cause there's a very good possibility that two of the best in the business. Yes. I am talking about you and I, you know, we're going to be back on the mic once again um, for Nationals because Grand Rapid is not that far away from Kalamazoo, Michigan, last time I checked. Nope, I'll be there. That's my plan. All righty. Excellent. And with that being said, um, thank you for your time. And everyone, and everyone watching, thank you for your time. And I hope that you have a wonderful evening and you enjoy the rest of your week. Until next time.